Welcome to the Up Full Life Podcast. I'm your host, B. Getz, and this is episode number 24, coming at you live and direct from the Vibe Junkie Studios in Oakland, California. We just cracked 5,000 downloads, and so grateful for all the people tuning in. Respect. Indeedy, we're back. Up for Life podcast. Episode 24. Super stoked to be back with you after about three week interim. I want to say thanks to Ruben Sadowski and Bo Williams coming on episode 23, turning it out. Got a lot of great feedback. Really appreciate everybody tuning in. As I said in the intro, we cracked 5,000 downloads, which is just a small feat. But every time we get a, another thousand, feels like an accomplishment. So, uh, yeah. Hit me up at b.getz at upfullife.com and uh, let me know what you're thinking about the podcast or make any suggestions. Holler at your boy. Uh, Really appreciate all the feedback. We don't get a ton of it, but when we do, we always respond. And uh, I'm just grateful for people listening. and, And please leave us a review on iTunes. That would be huge. We've got a bunch on there, but we haven't had any in like two and a half months. So if you're listening in and you have a spare two to three minutes, please cruise over to the iTunes page and leave a review. And be honest, you know, constructive criticism is great too. But if you're really feeling it, let the people know. Uh, I'm going to take a moment and uh, actually read a legitimate sponsor. Um, Came through uh, familial channels, but nonetheless, uh, really happy to uh, start to uh, receive attention and inquiries from different sponsors so with that let's turn the page here to onmyway.com the only mobile solution that pays its users not to text and drive the number one cause of death for young adults ages 16 to 25 is car accidents with the majority related to quote distracted driving on my way's mission is to reverse this epidemic through positive rewards Our users get paid for every mile they do not text and drive and can refer their friends to get compensated for them as well. The money earned can then be used to purchase items from participating advertisers through our On My Way cash offers. Clients like restaurants, spas, retail stores, online retailers, hotels, and really any consumer-based business looking to expand their customer base are able to participate in a campaign that is guaranteed to save lives and increase profits at the same time. That's on myway.com. It's an app. It's a, like the fastest growing app out there, apparently. And it sounds like a really awesome idea. Now, there are plenty of apps that will, and activity trackers that can track your driving, but now there's one that will actually pay you for the miles you log while driving and not texting. So, uh, yeah, you just basically can save up money, exchange uh, what you accrue for real life products. You can also get paid as a passenger, refer friends. Um, I'll leave you with a quote from Chloe Palmer, the co-founder of On My Way. On My Way believes that by giving our users positive rewards, we can end this horrific epidemic that is the number one cause of death for young people, 16 to 25. This just makes sense for our users, for our advertisers, our community, everybody wins. 
So, uh, yeah, check it out, onmyway.com. Shout out to my cousin Josh Granite who put me on to this. And uh, hopefully, maybe down the road, we might even have like a sort of a code upful of some kind. Just so that uh, you can recognize when the listeners are responding to the different sponsors. But for now, I'm just feeling it out. I want to do my man and this company a solid. And just start to get accustomed to reading ads on the air. Um, shouldn't have too many of them, but every now and again it helps. So with that, onmyway.com. Saving lives one download at a time. I'll let it ride out a little bit more with this gang star. Brand new. Rest in peace, Guru. The album's called One of the Best Yet. It dropped on Friday. You heard a Bad Name as I opened the segment. And now this is Hitman with Q-Tip from Tribe Called Quest. Let this ride out and then we'll uh, introduce episode's 24 guest, Mr. Will Blades. Oh, we're going to get a little bit of What's Real, too. This is my favorite song on the record. So I'm going to let it ride out for like a minute. And we'll be back with a little Will Blades. The real question is, what's real? Recognize and witness. I got soldiers that'll turn shit out, burn shit out. Do I come correctly when it's my turn? No doubt. I twist the trees in the cold with one hand wiping my nose. Girls say that I'm fly because they be liking my clothes. But the clothes or the money can't make the man. When I apply my vicious grip, you can't take it, man. Face it and understand. There are no winnings for you. What I'm beginning to do is bring an ending to you and your crew. I set a brew and at the same time drink the life out of you. I righteously come through, created in a likeness of you. Now we're going to pivot into episode 24's featured guest, and that's Will Blades. Uh, I'm going to read from his bio briefly, just to give folks a chance to get familiar. From cooking with blues legend John Lee Hooker, Oregon Summits with B3 master Dr. Lonnie Smith, Will Blades is gaining critical acclaim and international recognition. Blades, a native Chicagoan, has become the San Francisco Bay Area's first call organist and is rapidly gaining momentum internationally. He was named a rising star by Downbeat, it's wowing audiences with, as Amendola vs. Blades Project. He's worked with Stanton Moore. He's done a duo with Billy Martin from uh, Medeski Martin and Wood. Uh, he released his debut record in 2007 called Sketchy on Doodlin' Records, and you're hearing What's Up, Doc? from that effort in the background as we introduce Will to the show. That album features the legend Idris Muhammad on drums. So we talk a bunch about Idris in the interview, which is a lengthy interview, I must say. And, uh, you know, this project and podcast started as an idea about deep dives in the music culture, and it's definitely spread its wings and extrapolated in a myriad directions, and I'm proud of that, but... We're bringing it back to the roots on episode 24, and uh, with that, going deep with Will Blades for like almost 100 minutes. I mean, I might have uh, clipped uh, a little bit of space here and there, but yeah, pretty much let the whole interview ride, where he talks about his time with Idris and Dr. Lonnie Smith and the great, late great Melvin Sparks. As well as his time here in the Bay Area, which had recently come to a close, he was moving to Los Angeles right around the time of this interview at the end of the summer, late August, early September. We talked a lot about his experience as a working musician in the Bay Area. Of course, naturally, we had to talk about the Adam Deitch Project, because Will uh, connected with Adam, and the project is basically an organ drums 
you know, band, if you will, with uh, Benny and Zoidis from Lettuce. So well, at that time in the interview, just to break it up a little bit, I'm going to pause the interview and play the title track from Egyptian Secrets, which I've played on the show before, I believe, um, as a Vibe Junkie Jam of the Week. So actually, you know what, now that I think of it, I'm going to play the one song that Will wrote on the record, um, which is called Art Bar. And Will uh, talks at length about how him and Adam got together, the nature of the relationship between organ and drums, how that band took shape, how the album was recorded, the long, arduous climb to get it released. Then we wrap it up uh, with a little bit about the Amendola Blades project, which I was fortunate enough to see uh, that material performed last night here in San Francisco at SF Jazz. It's called Amendola versus Blades versus Skerrick versus Ciro Baptista versus Jeff Parker. Ciro being a percussionist with Trey Anastasio Band, of course, and Jeff Parker of Tortoise. So uh, that was amazing. Uh, sit down jazz show style. Um, and we got to hear a bunch of the material from the most recent Amendola Blades duo album which came out on Royal Potato Family Records earlier this fall. And it's called Everybody Wins. That's the name of the Amendola Blades album. And uh, they're performing material from that album this weekend for Night Stand at SF Jazz. So it was really perfect. We got a chance to powwow with Will a bit last night after the show and firm things up for this podcast. Yeah, that was a lengthy intro. This is a lengthy interview with Will Blades, Bay Area B3 bully, killer on the clavinet, Um, and you're hearing What's Up Doc from Will Blades' sketchy record. Um, Just to set it off, I'm going to play a good portion of the song High High Low from Amendola Blades' album, Everybody Wins, on Royal Potato Family Records. So... You'll hear a little bit of high-low, just to get the vibe right. And then you'll hear a lengthy chat with the incredible Will Blades, broken up by Art Bar. You're listening to the Up For Life podcast. I'm your host, B. Getz, and this is High Low. Mr. Will Blades, uh, local organist extraordinaire uh, on the move. On the move. Yeah, so thanks for uh, 
squeezing uh, the podcast and the interview into your rather busy and frantic last few weeks here in the Bay. Happy to do it, man. As you can see, we're surrounded by boxes and bubble wrap. Right. Bubble right. wrap and tape. Bubble wrap and tape, indeed. I, I've been a transient myself, so I understand. <laughs> but you, on the other hand, have been here a long time. In this house, yes. Yeah. And in the Bay. It's been right. 21 years in the Bay now, like as of August. 21 I, years. Like next month, it would be 21 years. Yeah, I moved here when I was 18. <laughs> wow. So. So it's the end of an era, for sure. Yeah, definitely. It's so, a beginning and an ending, and an ending and a beginning. Right. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about that because what really, you know, prompted me to want to do this interview, at least sooner rather than later, was you made a post, I would say around March, uh, basically saying, hey, look, I'm going to be leaving the Bay after 20 yeah, plus yeah, yeah. years. Um, and there's just this sort of outpouring of holy shit, like, right. it, it's, you are adopted son of the Bay Area, you know, sure, at least yeah. in the music community. Yeah, and it's funny, man, because like, um, you know, like it was posting that post that like made me realize like how much love and support has been in the Bay. And so I, I think I even posted that post a little prematurely because then everyone thought I was gone. But uh yeah, it really, I mean, I have to say, like, it really made me realize, like, how much support I have here. It was super cool. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot. I mean, I've seen it firsthand. I've only lived, I've only lived in California for six years and only in the Bay for two, but you're definitely a fixture, you know, and, and you you have, like, you're like a Kevin Bacon, where, like, <laughs> you, you've worked with everyone. Right. You know, about this point, either locally or out-of-towners that come through here regularly for sure so yeah. i want to get to all that but i don't want to start at the ending yeah, yeah so let's start at the beginning first so you're actually not from the bay you got here at 18 years old you're from chicago am i right yeah evanston illinois which is like the first suburb north of chicago where northwestern is okay and like northwestern i mean uh evanston's real similar to berkeley like super diverse like racially socio-politically like there's everything from like you know like North Shore mansions to like gangbangers like all in one uh, town. Um, so like it's a really it's just a diverse place that has sort of like a, a little bit of a half suburban like half city feel like the train from Chicago the L train goes through Evanston. Like growing up the. Um, the L train like basically went through my parents' backyard, so I was able to like just hop on the L and get to Chicago, you know, really easily. So I had access to the city, like my whole life. Okay. Through that, but yeah, so I'm technically from Evanston, though. Right, but you, like that's. City. I would say I'm from Philly, even though I'm from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, yeah, yeah, which is sure. just a hop, skip, and a jump. But I, I feel you. Yeah. Also, could just get not quite in my backyard, but. Right. A mile away, I could get on the speed line. That was what we call the the L version of in Philly. It's called the high speed line. Okay. And and be in Philly in seven minutes. Yeah, right. So a suburban kid, right? It, that's like a holy shit. It's yeah, like yeah. a whole world, right? Mm -hmm. So I can remember my musical experiences in that time. So, but what was some of the the embryonic musical experiences that you had in Chicago uh, that that sort of made you realize that music was some shit you were going to follow or be be a part of your life? I mean, like, the first thing was, like, I mean, this is, like, early 80s. I mean, I was born in 79, so, like, early 80s, like, MJ, Michael Jackson is huge. Yeah, so like, of course. Like my, Zipper jacket glove era. Yeah, yeah, I had, dude, I have a picture of with, with the, I got the glove on and the microphone, and I'm like, <laughs> singing, probably beat it. Like, my mom always tells a story about me. Um, we were in Colorado, and I was learning how to ski, and I was coming down the hill singing beat it. And that's sort of like my first like love of music was Michael Jackson. Like right. that's when I remember like just singing all those songs. And uh, I guess that like I haven't really thought about it, but that's sort of my first memory. And then I think what I my original instrument is drums, which I started at like seven or eight. And uh, like your parents bought you a drum kit, or you played it in band. Well, in, in so it was like school. it was basically like like back in the day when you had the Sears catalog. Uh -huh. And they had, like, instruments, and there was, like, the drum sets that were kind of, like, half real, half toy. 
Right. Like they had heads, there was cymbal and like a bass drum beater and everything. And so I got that first. And I had a snare drum too. Like I think it was maybe rented or something. Um, and You're so, doing like rudimentary snare drum stuff? Yeah, yeah. Like they start you off on right. a snare drum at in elementary school in fourth grade. Paradiddles uh, and shit. Yeah, just like super <laughs> basic stuff. But right. like within a year, like I was actually playing these toy drums. Um, and so my parents like bought me a drum set when I was nine. Proper. Yeah, like a proper drum set, like Red Sparkle Ludwig kit with all the original uh. hardware and everything, which like I would die to have now is actually worth money. And since I was a kid and it was a completely different era when vintage instruments like weren't right. hip or cool, like I just you destroyed, know, like, it. destroyed them. So, and those, like yeah. gave them away and stuff. And I'm... I would I would give anything to have that that kid back now. I bet. But um, my friend's dad that I grew with had a kid Ludwig Red yeah, Sparkle, yeah. just like you're describing, a real classic, you know. Yeah, man, it's like I I, I mean, you know, it's just a different era, man. Like I wanted a Tama or like a Pearl or sure. some sort of like double bass drum. We grew up like, in the same time. Yeah, right? yeah, like you know, six toms, like right. six rack toms and two floor toms and a bunch of cymbals and some china cymbals and back where you could twirl the sticks. Like that's, I was a metal guy. Yeah, yeah like, I totally. feel you. Yeah. What was funny, man, is like, so I what I remember is that like I had a babysitter that was watching the monkeys on TV or something. The television show? Yeah, and that's kind of what first got me into music as far as playing an instrument, it's just ironic because those dudes didn't play their instruments. Right. They did use like some super good LA studio session musicians for the, for the band, but it's just kind of <coughs> funny. And, but I remember also like listening to like early Beatles and stuff like that. Like you found it or your folks had it? I you, don't know. I just, yeah, I just remember. It was like, I just remember practicing to those Beatles songs. Okay. Um, which is, on the drums. Yeah, on the drums. And then I have two old, older brothers. Was it early Beatles, like sing songy Beatles? Yeah, yeah or like exactly. Sergeant Pepper? No, 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 no. It was like the sing songy okay. early stuff. Like, I want to hold your hand. Yeah, right. and baby, you can drive my and car. That, all that stuff. Like, but to a young person, that's that's they connect with that. It's like yeah, simple I, and really sort of right. infectious. Totally, and I that's think why they were so huge. Right, and I think it was probably really easy for a nine-year-old to play along with that stuff. Right. Like, Ringo's playing really simply, and, you know, it's, like, good time, so it's probably good stuff to play along to, yeah. I would think. Like, thinking about it now. But also, so I have t I had two older brothers that, you know, classic, like, turn you on to music. And what were um, they playing back then? Like, The Cure and Rush and... Same person, both bands? Uh, I can't remember who was, was, like, yeah, that's, that's pretty, really, that's pretty I different. love The Cure, and I love Rush, but yeah. I can never, you know. I can't remember, they represent like, different eras I want to say childhood. the younger one was Rush and the older one was The Cure. Okay. And just sort of like that era of music, you but know, that's just the 80s. 80s Cure, yeah. like dis Disintegration and Fascination yeah. Street, yeah, yeah, I mean, those sure. are great records. Yep. I know? was playing along to some of that that's stuff. That's awesome. I was playing along to Rush, I don't know that I was, like, yeah, doing it well, because that drumming is ridiculous. Yeah. But um, also, my parents, so my dad's a writer, my mom's an artist, and they're both big into music. My dad's a big jazz guy, so like I always heard jazz my whole life. So what that, were some of those artists that you remember, like jazz cats that wowed you back I, in the day? The only thing I really, really like specifically remember that he would always put on Billie Holiday, Gloomy Sunday, and I would ask for him to put it on, like when I was like three. Wow. I remember that, but I don't remember. I, he's like a big, you know, old, he likes old school tenor players like Ben Webster, Zoot Sims, Stan Getz, like the real Great old name. school. Yeah. yeah. People always ask if I'm related to him. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. My mom's seen him quite a few times, but, you know, it's before oh, nice. my time. Nice. Yeah. Atlantic City Jazz Festival. He's like an annual. Oh, play, sure. Played every year there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But yeah, so I just, you know, like. I just music was just around, right? And it's in and an era before like right. all this technology where there's just like you know it's like there's only there's TV and there's music and there's like sports, 
But just and some video games. Oh yeah, I mean primitive. Yeah. Um, but it was pre-internet, so everything was the effort, and in that yeah, effort yeah, was yeah, the for joy, sure. was the passion. Whether it was finding out records, yep. following sports teams in the standings, and yep. going to the newspaper and figuring out how many games out first you were, that kind of shit. Yeah. You don't have to do anymore. It's on your phone. Yeah, exactly. But I was gonna just bring it back to. The, I think it's essential, especially as we sit here. Your kids were just lurking. Um, you were talking about your folks, your dad, a writer, and, and you said your mom was a... She's an artist. Artist, so... That's actually and her they, painting wrapped up over there. Oh, and, awesome. Yeah, like, her art has been all over the house. <laughs> and it's coming with you to the yep, next step. of course. That's awesome. Um, I was just going to... And they bought you the drum kit. So, yeah. like, they fostered an environment where you were, like, empowered to, yeah, to do some music sure. shit. And not everyone has that... They might be a nuisance to some parents, or they might not be able to uh, afford a room to put the drums in, right. whatever it is. And it's really, I just thought about that, because I was also really encouraged and given a lot of space and opportunity to chase stuff. And that's important. I feel like, I'm not a parent, you are. Yeah, um, no, it is, man. It's like, to, I think it's more important than people realize, I think. Like, I mean, for me, my parents are both creative people. So, like, it, it made sense to foster something creative. Um and my mom said, just as far as like instruments are concerned, um, she would much rather have me going to town on the drums than like have to hear a squeaky violin. You know, like a kid just right. just can't get a sound on a violin. It's just like scratchy and squeaky. Like she would much prefer a drummer to that. Um, but yeah, I I think like having kids now. I mean, both my kids are super into music, and the way they experience music is super different than the way you and I did. Um, so in some ways, bad. In a lot of ways, great. You know, uh, it's just different. Just the way that our folks felt about us in some ways. Yeah, you know? in some ways. I mean, maybe it's my different My parents for... could wrap their head around Guns N' Roses. You know? <laughs> right. I, yeah, yeah, I yeah. wanted to be Axel more yeah, than anything. I wanted to be you Slash. Know? You know, sure. so... But I'm just saying, so they were just like, what do you get out of this? You yeah. know, they took me to the Philadelphia Orchestra one Saturday a month, part of the kids concert. And I was a classically trained pianist all the way oh, up through wow. college. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like they, they fostered that. And then I was like, I want the Beastie Boys and, and Guns N' Roses and eventually the Grateful Dead. Yeah. And they never could ever plug into any of that mm. because it was so far out of left field for them. You right. know what I mean? So here you're sitting here talking about your kids experiencing music a different way, even though you like fostered them. Right. And then some of it's quote bad, but that might be, but I don't even guns. need, yeah. I don't even mean like musically bad. I it's just how mean, they get it. yeah, just like the whole, like, you know, like my daughter doesn't understand paying for music. Right. That's more what I mean. Like my son is sort of, he's 19. So he's more like kind of in between. Like, he had CDs, discs, you know, right? like, yeah, totally. We used to buy him CDs when he was younger, and I don't know if we ever bought any. But, I mean, he's definitely of that, you know, generation. The, the streaming generation. So they don't totally understand paying for music or, you know, that there's a value in that way. I wouldn't say, you know, you know, everyone when they're a certain age, like, when you're 11, 12, you don't necessarily have the best musical taste, and it sort of matures, and I've seen that happen with my son, and it's really cool. And now my daughter, who's uh, 14 in like two months, or actually almost a month, she's, I see her taste starting to mature, and it's really cool. Like, it's going from like more bubblegum stuff to a little more like creative stuff. And we share like, uh, artists and songs and stuff that we like and my son has turned me on to like new hip hop that's that I awesome may not have known about otherwise heard right or like I didn't know like yesterday I just found out he likes Mad Lib and I was like dude you like Mad Lib that's awesome I right. didn't know that or like you know just stuff like that like sure. Mad Lib's been around forever you yeah, know since yeah. like I was almost mid 90s yeah like, oh yeah, 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 yeah uh, like a loot pack even early 90s loot I think, pack right? he did the thing that was my first introduction to him when I got to college, which was in 96. My boy Jeff Artist hit me with the Loot Pack, which okay. was his like crew, Mad Lib, and uh, two MCs. Right. That was the earliest. And then, of course, there was the Dilla stuff and the Stone's Throw stuff. But I would say, yeah, like that's that's like our generation, young cat. Yeah, like, yeah, for sure. You know, like I was born in 78, so we're right. right yeah, the same 79, life. 78. And I just like, the, I remember going away to college in 96 and like, 
coming out of my little South Jersey Philly bubble and having cats school me on like Ghostface Killer, right? You know, <laughs> you know, like I mean, I knew the Wu Tang, but to to understand the, you know the layers and stuff, it needed right. to be really explained to me. Yeah. So, I that's like probably kind of the th- type of thing your son's going through now, where he's like discovering yeah. artists, and then you're like, holy shit, you like yeah. Mad Lib? It's like, but he found it on his own terms. Right. You didn't put it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I think there's some influence, like, I, I think, I don't really know, I mean, I haven't, like, asked him, but, uh, you know, it's like, my wife is also a musician, and a okay. uh, big music head, and, a, you know, we have different styles and stuff, but, um, so he just has heard a lot of music his whole life, oh, well, both of them have heard right. a lot of music their whole lives, so I think, I think that has to somehow influence them. You know, yeah. whether it's like subconsciously, subconsciously or not, or like, cause like for me, like there's environmental things. It's like, I like jazz. My dad played jazz my whole life. Like right. it, there's a sound that resonates with me in jazz for whatever reason. And right. that could be linked to the fact that I heard it my whole life or, um, uh, I love the blues. I l- like any music that has a bluesy feeling for the most part. And that's like Chicago, man. Right. Like you can't ignore the blues. Like it's just around you. Yeah. You know, you, you get on the L and you get out of the subway, there's like some dad with his three year old kid playing the blues. You know, there's right. like a free blues festival. There's just it's just around, you know. It's essential. So I think these things like are environmental in some ways. But going back to what you said, it's funny because my parents, or at least my mom like, there's definitely some stuff they didn't understand, like, maybe, like, Motley Crue. <laughs> of course. And, like, Guns N' Roses. and took me to Motley Crue. And, but <laughs> I remember getting my mom into Metallica. Like, some stuff, yeah. probably not everything, but, they, yeah, they were always supportive of, like, you know, I, I saw Guns N' Roses. Dude, I went Metallica to a Guns N' Roses music. show in, it, I think, 91, 92. On the Illusion Tour, yeah. Mom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Rosemont things? Horizon. And my mom, my, where my parents let me go on a school night. Without and, them? Yeah, my, our, my, our, my, my good friend Andy, his, his, uh, his older brother Pete took us, who was like, a, you know, like in high school or something like that, or college maybe by that point. I'm yeah. not sure. My mom took us on that, to me and my cousin Dan, uh, to the Use Your Illusion Tour. Soundgarden opened. Smashing Pumpkins opened Interesting. on this one, and right. they were like a local Chicago band at that point. Oh, they weren't sure. like yeah, yeah, the Smashing Pumpkins, you know, the, yeah, like, exactly. Or Dream, you know, on the, before yeah, no, it was more like Gish before uh, Gish they before they really blew up yeah. like more nationally. But you know, they like they were like three hours late. Of I course. got home at like three a.m. on a school night. My mom, right. I think my mom let me sleep in. So that, like, kind of shows you, like, even though maybe that wasn't their music, like, they were still supportive right. of me, you know, going to shows and checking yeah. the music out live. Like, that's, and you're right, like, a lot of parents aren't like that. Like, I have a lot of right. friends that were either shut down by their parents, like, with instruments or just trying to go that kind of, yeah, yeah, it's just, like, it's pretty rare to have, like, parents that are that yeah. supportive. yeah. Um, Agreed. So it's cool. It's great, man. I mean, it's it's a huge reason that I turned into a musician. You know, they, they allowed me. Yeah. To, you know, fostered that. Yeah, for sure. So you were saying you love the blues and the blues of Chicago. Like, yeah. so for me, it was like I, I loved metal, and then I and the Beasties and hip hop, and then shortly after that gun show, like six months later, I saw the Dead, and okay. everything changed. Yeah. So at what age do you? Uh, sort of step into the blues like this is my thing well because when we talked before you had said you know before i even got to the bay right i was a blues guy i'm from chicago I came up playing the blues. yeah so okay so i guess it's like i remember not so much like specific artists or specific people i was like hearing in chicago if you know because it felt more like just an environmental sound to me, right. like thinking back on it. 
But I remember, so I, when I was like 12, I started playing guitar and that became like a serious thing for me. Left drums behind and, and sort of trying I didn't leave them behind. Like I kept playing in like school band, like marching band I had to do in high school, um, jazz band. Um, I still took lessons until the time I was about 16. So, but, but guitar kind of became more of like the, the forefront, even okay. though I was still playing drums. Um. So when I was when I had started playing guitar, I remember that we were like me and a, dr- a drummer friend were just jamming in my parents' basement. And I just remember we started playing some bluesy stuff and just the way it felt to like hit that feeling, it was like I didn't want to stop. Right. It was just like I it was just almost like it felt so good to feel that feeling that I just wanted to keep doing it. Um and I think for me, it was more of a process, and this has happened with jazz too, of going back, backwards. Like, it's not like I was like 14 and checking out John Lee Hooker and B.B. King and stuff like that. It was more like uh, when, I bec- when I was like 14, I got into Hendrix. My Still bro- as a guitar player? Yeah, or yeah, yeah. Or transition uh, to Oregon yet? I know, I had... St- yeah, that's later. So, um, I was playing guitar. My brother turned me on to Hendrix. And so I went into this huge Hendrix phase, like obsessed with Hendrix, like reading all the biographies, watching all the VHS tapes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like just checking out all the Hendrix, like learning. And I would always just like learn the tunes. Like I would always just, that was how I learned to play. Both, even though I was taking lessons on drums, I was taking lessons on guitar. It was always an oral thing, like learning songs off records. Right. And my first guitar teacher, who thanks to Facebook I just reconnected with, uh, Bob Stern, he I would just bring tunes into him, and he would figure them out by ear. I had show a teacher like that. Yeah, for a piano. Yeah, awesome. It's like yeah. it's really the best way to learn. I mean, I think as a kid because it's more. It's like learning a language, you yeah. know, you, you learn it by ear. You don't learn a language by written language. Right, right. But anyway, to so... To see that in front of you, though, like, I never picked it up like you did. I could never right. just hear then play. But this guy, he could play anything. Mm. So I put a, a Grateful Dead, you know. I remember the time I was like, can we do this? Passenger was the song. It's a random song. And, uh, and he heard it once and he sat down and he fucking played it. Mm. Like melody of the lyrics with the right hand and right. the rhythm with the left hand and in one listen sure and then, and then like that, I was awestruck by that so yeah. I can imagine you're saying like you your teacher did that and, yeah, and totally. then you were able to somehow I mean he, harness that ability to hear then play well, yeah I think when you see someone do it it just helps you I don't know you see someone envision yourself I, I didn't, and when you're young you're impressionable so you don't think about how do you do that? You just right. do it. Right. Um, but so, yeah, I got into Hendrix. I was learning all the tunes. And um, that's sort of the first, like, gateway into the blues. Well, that's the yeah. thing. is that Especially well, the early stuff. Well, all of it. Because the thing that people don't realize about Hendrix, like, no artist <laughs> is 100% original. It just yeah. doesn't exist. Like, to me, all the legendary musicians, whether it's, Hendrix, like Stevie, Miles, like anyone that that's like one of the cats, you know, Mount like yeah, they, yeah, exactly. They came from somewhere, and they had influence. It's by like uh, we call it, I like some me and some of my friends call it like uh, f- past future, because it's like building on the fast the past for this future sound, and, and to me that's what Hendrix is. It's like taking John Lee Hooker. And Albert King and all these blues guys and just futurizing it into what he did. Into this, like, psychedelic blues rock thing. Um, So I think, like, that was maybe the first sort of thing that gave me a gateway into the blues. And then you worked backwards from there to the... Well, kind of like, I mean, I was... My whole teenage years was, like, Hendrix, Pink Floyd... Which is what got me into Oregon partially. Um, Santana, like 
all that stuff, the doors, like that. That's all organ rock, though. I mean, a Santana I heavy organ. Well, see, that's Floyd the, is what Nick Mason, the organist. No, that's a drummer, uh, oh, right. Rick Wright. Right. Yeah. Richard Wright, right? Okay. Yeah, so Those I know that's, that's organ led rock bands. Yeah, exactly. Doors, so that's it. Kind of just naturally started going there. Um, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, and you know, also, but David Gilmore from Pink Floyd is super bluesy. Yeah. And understated and really soulful. He's an like, incredible guitarist. Yeah, dude, yeah. he's. I hear that stuff now, and I'm like, man, it's so like understated and simple and soulful and just emotional it, builds. Yeah, and, but it's not shreddy at all. No, not at all. So um, a lot of vibe. Santana's super bluesy. Right. Um, same thing, real simple. So that's like I think the it was sort of like the combination of growing up in Chicago and like getting into all that stuff, like classic rock. I guess you could call it. This is yeah. like what sort of set up this gateway for me to like get deeper into blues. And it, it kind of happened somewhat organically when I got out to the Bay later on. So when you got to the Bay, um, I've always wanted to ask, so was the whole Fog City funk thing happening here when you got here? Did you plug into that? That whole like Dan Prothero? Yeah, I don't know. Like I was aware of it to only to a degree. Okay. So what was happening upon your arrival? Like where did you plug? All right. Into? So I moved here in '98. Okay. Like in the first dot com boom, everything was like. I'm, I'm curious why here then. Was uh, it related well, to that boom or something no, no, musical? No, no, no. So like, I. I went to college one year in Chicago after high school at Columbia College, and I just really needed a change of scenery. Um, it just felt like that thing of where the place you grew up, you need to leave. Sure. I um, knew that one. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. I, most of us do. I, except for people in the Bay. They love staying here, yeah. which I, I can't blame them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I just I felt like I needed a change. And I had befriended some Northwestern students that were four years older than me. So when I was a senior in high school, they were seniors at Northwestern. They graduated, and uh, they moved to a warehouse in West Oakland in the hood. And so I moved. I, I They were kind of like, yo, just come out here, live with us, play in our band. And, you know, they were older. I looked up to them. It just sounded... I had never been to the Bay Area before. I've been to L.A. twice. Um, never been to San Francisco. Never been to Oakland or Berkeley. Um, and so it was one of those things, like, my parents were like, hey, you can go, but, like, find a school. So I found this little liberal arts school called New College of California that was on Valencia 19th. And this was back, like, when you had to, like, look at the, uh, like, college guidebook sure like and in there it's new college of california rolling admissions so it was easy to get in um and the there was like one jazz performance teacher there and it was this guy herbie lewis and it like in the bio was like played with and it listed a few people that i was like whoa like monk and coltrane wow so i was like yeah that's what i want to do i want to Go study with this guy at the school, which, you know, I wasn't like a good student in high school or middle school or elementary <laughs> school. Like, it just, this was like the right vibe for me. Like, going to a big university or like going to Berkeley or somewhere like that, Berkeley, Boston, just wasn't like the right vibe for me. Um, so, so it was mainly because of those guys telling me to come out. And play in their band. What kind of band was it? It was just like a jam band kind of vibe. Okay. Um, and they asked you to come out and play organ? Yes. And at that point, like I really wasn't an organ player or a keyboard player, but I had by that point been interested in it and bought a Hammond M3, which is like a, ba like a baby B3. Right. Um, and I brought that out with me and all my other like drums, guitars and stuff. And so I was still a guitar player, though, at school. Like, when I was going to new college, I started off playing guitar there. And then Herbie Lewis um, was, like, really adamant. Like, I was trying to play all three instruments, drums, guitar, and organ at that point. And he was really adamant that I choose one. 
put all your energy into that. Yeah. And at that point, <laughs> I just felt like Oregon was what I needed to do. There's a billion guitar players on earth. Um, and I just, I had just by that point really fallen in love with the Hammond. So, so I just put my effort into that. So um, you had the M3, but yes. that doesn't have, that doesn't pedals, have right? pedal. Well, it has these weird pedals that not, not very many. And then the, in, in the lower register draw bars, uh, well, the lower keyboard doesn't the bass notes don't go all the way down okay so there wasn't a lot of bass happening on that this was and when i was playing in this band they had a bass player yeah there's a bass it was two guitar right. players bass uh drums me and a couple guys a few of the guys sang gotcha um but in answer to your question uh about what was happening in the bay i mean i was 18 turned 19 like a few weeks after i got there i had a fake id we, I played a gig like five days after I got here at this place called Mix Lounge on Van Ness. And back then, there was just tons of clubs and right. tons of places to play. Like, if you were a little amateur band like us, there was, you know, a ton of gigs. Um, so we did a lot of gigs just locally. Um, I played a gig at Jupiter in Berkeley, which I just played there like a couple months ago, like still playing there there's that's like one of the few places that's maybe still around from back then from back then for the most part but there was just a lot of clubs there was a lot of music happening there was a lot of local bands uh I, i'm trying to remember like who i mean a lot of classic bay area stuff like i remember will bernard right i remember his name from back then i think i went and saw him once and the um, whole like tj kirk thing was happening that was later? maybe before that yeah, that Earlier was like I think that. it was okay. like in the that was more mid nineties. Okay, a li- maybe that was a little bit before that. Interesting. Um, but yeah, um, but there was also a lot of jazz clubs too back then. There was right. Bruno's, there was Pearls. Um, it just there was just a lot of places. There was a lot of music happening. And the interesting thing about the dot com era, as opposed to like this whole tech thing that's happening now in the city, is that. People were out in the clubs back then. Like, clubs were... There were people in them all the time. Like, right. I don't remember playing, like, even with this band that nobody knew. Like, I don't remember playing shows that were, like, completely dead. Ever. Right. Um, but there was, it was like, like... It just cost seems of like... living was lower, and there was a whole lot different innocence to that era. Like, yeah. It, tons of people hadn't gotten rich yet. And opportunities. Well, it was starting to happen, and like it was sort of the first wave of like people getting right. evicted, and it being really hard to get apartments because like there were thirty people in line for one apartment. Had it hopped over to this side of the bay? Yet? No, that's the thing is that the East Bay was like you could not pay people to, to come here. over. You no, know, just even to come over to the East Bay to like hang do out. anything. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it was like. Because Oakland was dead, like right. just at least as far as like people in the city were concerned, there wasn't a ton going on. There was some cool stuff, like in the neighborhood that I lived in, which was Thirty Second and Adeline, which is like the real hood back then. Right. There was down the street on San Pablo with Sweet Jimmy's, which was which is now the new parish. Yeah. But back then it was like an old you know jazz club, right. you know, like in the hood. Like, the real deal place. E- yeah. Eli's Mile High Club, same thing. Like, old school blues club where all, like, old, like, real deal blues cats played. Um, and there was, like, a window of time where that was, like, still in its true cultural essence. And, like, San Fran was sort of, like, blowing up. Yeah. But, but people hadn't retreated to Oakland yet. So that Not went- at all. Not at all. No. And I was going to say, just in answer to your question, I do yeah. remember seeing, like, Galactic... With Robert Walter opening at the Fillmore, like back then, yeah, like ninety eight. It's just as far as me being era, where, yeah, right. like the Fog City era. I don't remember much else at that point. I was just like checking out, like and gigging wherever tu- you could, touring acts and stuff like that, and some right. local acts. And I always, I, I asked Robert and I asked Eddie when I had him on, I Robert just about that era because I was like, I had this sort of romanticized and like just ironic that that's pretty much right when you got here. Yeah, and and. That's a sound like the boom boom room still trades on that ethos, you know, sure. of that funk groove. And like you're collaborated with List is a who's who of like the greats 
you know, in that regard, Dr. Lonnie Smith, right. Mike Clark. So how do you go from random dude who moved out here and was a keyboardist of a jam band in a warehouse in Oakland to an understudy of the great Dr. Lonnie Smith? Um, how did that happen? So basically, at New College with, with Herbie Lewis, um, who was a bass player, he played like you know, like I said earlier, you know, Monk, his, his resume was crazy. Like he grew up with Bobby Hutcherson and Billy Higgins. Like that was his, like that was like his garage band growing up. So he played with McCoy Tyner and like like he played with everybody. So through him, I got he was he was another per he was another person that was very big on. It was not. It was not a university education at all. It was like one day we may show up and he just wants to put on whatever records he wants to put on, and we're in silence just listening to records. The next time he might like show us a concept and like bounce out of class and like not come back or come back at the end of class. Uh, he was like a pretty all over the place figure. Uh, <coughs> Like you know, he had I love so much, those kind of professors. Yeah, I mean, it was Anyone. sort of like I love, I like looking back at it now because I realize how much I learned. But it was really frustrating at the time because it was, it felt like I was pulling teeth to get information out of him. But really, he was teaching like these really deep, like Mr. Miyagi life lessons that yeah. like I still like value now, and it's still like these really simple concepts that still unfold. But so he he would have us. He was sort of like the the real like I don't know. He would he gave me the jazz education, just straight ahead jazz education. Like learning these tunes, you have to know these songs. You gotta oh you don't know this record by this cat. You gotta know this cat. And he was like super cutthroat. Like he was in New York back in the day, and those guys did not play. Right. Uh, like. I remember when he, like, early on he came up to me, he was like, he called me William, he f refused to call me Will. William, do you practice? And it just, I remember that question was just kind of like, ouch. Because he was sort of calling me out. Right. Uh, and he would get, you know, there was, he told, the, I think he told the class, not me specifically this, but there was one time where he was like, man, don't be telling people you're studying with me, man. I don't want to be embarrassed. Like, he was super... I mean, it was, like, rough. He, right. he really, like, didn't hold back on us. Uh, and one time I challenged him just being... A, you know, like, when you're... This was earlier on, like, when I was probably the first year, 19 or something like that. And I challenged him on something <laughs> that I felt like... Like, he didn't give me the materials. I felt like he should have given me the materials. And, like, he basically shut my ass up forever. And, you know, like, put me in my place so I understood that I'm the one learning. He's the elder. I'm learning from him. And so that's really important. That, A, with his comments about practicing, his comments about us, like, not talking about studying with him because he doesn't want to be embarrassed. Like, A how serious these guys take music it's not a joke to them right. it's not like it's not to say they don't get up there and have fun and entertain the audience when they're up there but they take the level that they play at super seriously like it's no joke like those guys that's all they had was music and right uh they lived it a thousand percent so he really taught me about that and he taught me about just respecting the guy with the knowledge you right. know like don't challenge him even if he did do some crazy stuff sometimes right um method to the madness yeah totally um but he really set me up to to like to um have a good foundation going forward as a, like a prof professional musician and also he continued that whole oral thing right and the thing that a lot of people especially in this day and age don't understand because of like university jazz studies all this stuff this is this music wasn't originally like a, like it's not to say that the musicians didn't know what they were doing because they really did 
but it didn't take place in universities and classrooms. Right. It was street music. Yeah. And it's an oral music. These guys shared concepts with each other. They, you know, they played and jammed together. They listened to records and picked stuff off records like I was earlier with my guitar teacher and in, before that as a drummer. So like it reinforced that in me um just the whole learning music uh orally, you know. And uh so that was really good for me. And so from there this other northwestern student who was a little bit younger than the other guys who I didn't know was working the door at the Boom Boom Room. And this was like I was 19 so this would have been like just the following summer after the year after I moved there. Um he had he was the doorman through like his brothers his brothers uh his brother went to school with the bartender who's actually now the owner of Madrone. So the owner of Madrone and Xander are old college buddies. Okay. So he used to be the bartender at at Boomer back in the day. Anyways, side note. So John, my friend, had the happy hour gig from five to eight, and he would just play solo, like singing blues tunes. He would sing and play guitar. So I met him. We went down there. I can't totally, I don't totally remember how it all went down, but basically we met. There's a freaking B3 with two Leslies up there on stage at the time. House there, Oregon. Yeah, House B3. Uh, at the time, there was the Leslie that's there behind the organ now. And there was one on the other side of the stage, like in the other corner. So there's two lessons. So somehow me and one of my friends from the band and a couple other guys, this drummer I was going to school with at New College, we started doing the happy hour with John. Um, As a little trio? Yeah. uh, No, this was like a... So there was guitar... Organ, his friend also played piano, like keyboard, piano, drums, and bass. Um, so this was, I wasn't really digging into the, the bass thing yet. Okay. I was just sort of a uh, one-handed organ player. <laughs> right. Um, so that went on for a while, and then they decided they wanted to go down to a trio. And I remember... They were standing outside the warehouse because we were rehearsing or something and I went outside and they were like, you're going to play bass. I was like, what? No, I don't want to do that. They're like, you have to do it. And so they forced me to do it unwillingly. And the B3 at the boom had pedals. Yeah, yeah. So you kind of learned on that one? Well, so at a certain point, I bought a C3, which is the same thing as a B3. It's just in a different cabinet, but it's the same organ. So I have, probably by that point, I owned that. Okay. Um, so you could practice at home on it. So. Yeah. Or maybe it was a little bit after that, that I, that I bought it. I, I don't remember the timing, but so, um, so I play it every week and that's the thing. That's, that's the thing is that these gigs don't exist now like that. Like to play the boom room from five to eight, they were paying us to do it. Like and it was packed. Like, it wasn't it was, packed because yeah, it was five to eight, but it, it was had, like like regular. There were folks. people there. There were like ten to twenty people. Right. There was enough people in there that you didn't want to embarrass yourself. So just the combination of like playing, having a gig every week, where a I didn't want to be embarrassed in front of the audience. I didn't want to be like scuffling with these musicians. The drummer I really looked up to. He was really good. So um, it was just playing every week for three years um and so what happened was and i I still remember like the first few gigs of playing bass was like super shaky and just to clarify something that a lot of people don't realize is that playing bass on the hammond is a combination of the left hand and the foot right like the way jimmy smith and all the traditional like jazz organ players do it dr lonnie it's not straight pedals. It's right. like a combination between the left hand and the foot. So, um, 
So like the Jimmy Smith, Jimmy McGriff, Groove Holmes. Yeah, all those, all those guys cats play that played, way. Played. It's a lot of left hand, and the foot is like helping accent the left hand. Okay. Um, but, but the bass lines are being played primarily left hand. Left hand, and the foot is like sort of like accenting, and it sort of acts as like a plucking sound. It's gotcha. like a percussive thing. So what would ha- what was happening is. Now I was in this boomer room scene, and back then it's, it was nothing like what it is now. For the mo- for the most part, it was more of a blues jazz. It was a blues like club. Cool it cat. was it was John Lee Hooker's boomer room, right? Which just meant that who hung out there? Middle well, age he would be there. Folks? I mean, he would hang out there, but like it was it was in pretty, the crowd. It wasn't the Fillmore spillover. It was definitely Fillmore spillover, but it was also like since it was John Lee Hooker's boomer room, like a, a lot of tourists would go there. Um. Okay, so it was it was like I want to say the the crowd was pretty diverse because you had a lot of old Fillmore heads, like those guys would be at the happy hour at the bar. And I don't know if you've ever noticed old, old hippies types and, and no Phoenix like and stuff. like no this was more like old the old black Fillmore cats. Okay, you know from, when I think Fillmore, I think like Bill Graham, fucking mid late sixties Grateful Dead. Yeah, but you got to remember. About- we're talking like Fillmore was a primarily black neighborhood, neighborhood right? Before and before the Fillmore, that was like the Harlem of the West. That they, area, they, yeah, that's where like all the jazz musicians played back in the uh, back in the fifties, forties, fifties, sixties, probably. Um, it was primarily a black neighborhood, so there's all these old school OG dudes. Who would hang at the hang at the bar, and if you look next time you're at the Boomer Room, at the bar there's these little placards with these guys' names on them, and all those photos that are on the way to the bathroom, yeah, like some of those guys, like all those photos on the wall leading to the bathrooms, like that's that era, right? Like all the cats that played there, some of the cats that hung out there, pictures of John Lee Hooker there. Um, so, like, a lot of the older cats, I remember them being around at the happy hour. They would be um, at at the later shows, too. So it was, like, this real mix of, like, younger people and, like, old OG Fillmore cats right. and tourists. Like, it was a kind of combination really of all, all these people. And so it was a lot of local blues acts. Like... Tuesday was Blues Beat, Oscar Myers, which is now Steppin. Uh, but back then it was Blues Beat on Tuesdays and Brenda Boykin's band on Thursdays. I can't remember the name of the band. So there was like these house bands. And then there was also like an, another OG band that did the Friday happy hour. And so Friday and Saturday it would be like either national touring blues acts or like... Uh, local blues acts so i would you know like this this was not a late night club this was like normal hours like right. i think on the weekends it was like nine thirty to one thirty. like it didn't even go to two um so you know we'd get done with our set i'd go grab some food and then i would check out whoever was playing and i did that every week unless i had another gig but every week i was getting to see like some great local act or some great legend legend um and that was sort of like how i began to sit in with people and meet people and and just learn about more deeply about the blues and i was starting to check it out more like on my own in addition to all the jazz stuff i was getting through herbie lewis um and then Eventually, so it all, let me back up. So Tuesday nights, Oscar Myers Blues Beat, one dollar cover charge. Um, the place is packed every Tuesday night. It's just a band of like legendary cats, like legendary local cats who have all done super heavy stuff. The saxophone player Julian Vaught, who just passed away recently, um, was one of the original flamingos band r&b band from back in the 60s they're like in the rock and roll hall of fame the organ player lewis madison there's a picture of him on that wall at boomer room 
he was one of the original Famous Flames, James Brown and the Famous Flames, and he was playing every week. He was older, he was a little, uh, you know, a little <laughs> slow, but um, he's, so, legend has it that he's the cat that wrote, I feel good, please, 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 try me, all that James Early Brown stuff. stuff. Pompadour era. Yes, <laughs> like all, like, yeah. the story is that That's he, he was stuff. in town, with James Brown, the whole the whole band got, or one of the band members got in a fight with JB, pushed him down in the mud in his white suit. He fired the whole band, and Lewis was there in San Francisco ever since. Like he just he just stayed. So, and it's not it, Lewis never said, "Man, I'm I'm the guy that wrote," you know. Right. Like everyone else around me is like, "Yo, that's the guy that really wrote that shit." And so I was hearing him play every week, and I was hearing him sing those songs. And um, he would have a drink or two and sometimes not be functioning so well after that. So at this time, like, Oscar knew me and would, like, sometimes float me a little money to just hang around in case that happened. Right. In case he wasn't actually allowed to drink, but sometimes he would sneak it. Um, so I would uh, I just hang around, check out the band, and it was just super educational, you know, to see these old guys, you know, just they they just play their asses off. And I remember sometimes on the last set, you know, it'd get empty. It's a Tuesday night. It'd be late. You know, it still right. went to like almost 1.30 on a Tuesday night. So I remember this one specific time I was watching them and they were playing their asses off. And I turned around and there was like hardly anyone there left. But like that kind of thing sticks with you. Like these dudes are playing. Like, right. They're not like just messing around because... It's empty. Right. I I have this very vivid, vivid memory of it. It's like one of those like, oh okay, like that's what the shit's about. So, anyways, Oscar eventually, like Lewis, just couldn't hang, um, just because of his age and everything. And so Oscar hired me. I didn't know the songs. Like I had no business being up there, but Oscar's, like, had some belief in me. I guess, and gave me the gig every Tuesday. So um, he would literally play trumpet <coughs> and lead the band. It's right, you know, he's got his trumpet in his right hand, leading the band, and then he would have his left hand under his right hand like this, and holding up the the number of the chords. You know, like one, right, five, one. So I'd just be watching him. The other thing I would do is, since I had played guitar, I would check out the guitar player's hands and see like what chords he was playing. Um, and also, ironically, Henry Odin, who was the bass player, learned how to play walking bass lines from listening to organ players. So now I'm getting, he's right behind me, and I'm hearing these super deep bass lines that are that were educated by organ records right. back at me. And I'd be playing, I'd really be listening to what he was playing. Like really checking his shit. It's out. like reverse engineering the bass yeah. line. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Cool. So so that was my experience, man. It was like these guys, like I didn't really have any business being up there, but they knew they could see the passion. They could see that's like a true the, apprenticeship right there. It, totally. And it's like they, they could see the work ethic and that I was trying to get better and that I was improving. And so they let me up there. And so that band played every Tuesday. The other band played every Saturday. Then I, I started getting asked to do... Actually, in Bluesby, I'll say this, also would do like one night a month on like a Friday or Saturday also. So that's like nine times I'm playing at Boomer Room a month. Right. That's and then, why you started becoming known as the house organ Yeah, guy. and I kind of became like known as the house organ player there. And then the Saturday band would sometimes would usually do like a, a Wednesday night um, like once a month. So, you know, 
then it then it became the thing of um, Alex was really supportive, and he would uh, he would um, like have people let me sit in and stuff, and he would recommend me like, oh, you know, I'm an organ player. Why don't you why don't right. you have this kid play with you? And like guys from like um, uh, where's John Lee Hooker from the city uh, in Tennessee? Um, Clarksdale, no Mississippi. Sorry. Clarksdale, Dale, Mississippi, like real deal blues guys coming in and I get to play with them. And so this is like highly educational, like, right. like some really formative years, you know, like, or like I'm underage at this point, right. like I'm not even 21 wow. and I'm just soaking it all up. And, um, basically I, my second home, my, my two second homes were new college of California music room with Herbie and the boom mm-hmm. room. Yeah. And, it's a it was amazing, education. man. It's like, what's amazing to me about it is I accidentally, or, you know, through the universe making things happen, had this super old school education. Like, that's the way cats used to learn right. back in the day. You just get a gig, and the older cats show you the way. Right. And that's what happened to me. And I look back on it now, and it's amazing. Like, I'm so grateful that it happened that way like I don't really read music uh, so there's like some holes in my musicianship but like I feel like I'm just so grateful that I had that experience but you know Boom Room Room was packed like Saturday night, Friday night there's a line down you know like when there's like a late night show like an after party, like right. if we do like a lettuce after party or we used to do galactic after parties, it was always like a line down the block. Right. It was like that every freaking Saturday night, like in 2000, 2001. But it was that blues crowd you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's just right. like, but that's just a normal night at right. Boomer I'm saying you weren't piggybacking another show. No. That was no, 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 no crowd. yeah. This is just, or yeah, like. No, they're not even our crowd. It's just like people just go to the Boom Room room no matter like the who's boom playing. Boom crowd. That's yeah, yeah. It's like, like you're not, you're not, it's not an after party for whoever's no, 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 playing. It's just else. like it's the Boom Boom Room show. And it's just to say that, that like ticket. that's the huge difference between then and now. Not just Boom Room room, but the whole city, man. 100%. It's like back then, man. Like the places were packed with and there people, were gigs. and yeah. yeah. So there, it just was easier to play a lot and. Like, you know, business wise, it was a little better. Yeah, I'm maybe. Sure. Not, I mean, I was still young, so I wasn't like making a ton of money playing gigs. Right. I'm not making a ton of money now. But you but, didn't have the overhead. But yeah, it was like uh, I could live off 600 bucks a month right. back then. You know, or different times. It was. Cost of living was different, and your own. Yeah, and I was 20. I could eat burritos every day and be right. completely happy and not gain weight and. Yeah. <laughs> But that was, yeah, that was, so that was like the boom room room back then. And then... When does it trans... Well, I, two things. I, I want to know when you get to go from local legend cats to, you know, all-timers like Dr. Lonnie Smith and Mike Clark. Like, right. And, and it also, when does the boom boom room shift from, like, the scene you're talking about to sort of this jazz fest diaspora of, right. of funk and jam sort of world? Because I, you know... I first got out here in 03. I visited Boom Boom Room once, and I think it might have still been John Lee Hooker's Boom Boom Room. I don't even know what we went for, but right. I went once. And then when I came back in 2013 and moved here, it was like an epicenter of the sort of jazz fest culture right. of the Bay. And and you, obviously, then and now, you were part of all of it. Right. Well, I mean, it's it's funny because it was such a big part of my education with the blues Thing, but I would say there was always New Orleans acts like Alex Zan now Zan he was Alex back then now right. he's Xander <laughs> same he, dude same dude <laughs> two names back then he always had New Orleans acts come through like so I like and radiators and all that shit well yeah like I met Anders Osborne Quite back too then small for the radiators actually uh maybe yeah I don't I don't remember them coming through right. but Wild Magnolias came through uh, yeah. um Anders Osborne, I remember sitting in with him back then, and I met Doug Beloit and uh, Eric Bolivar, and like I, I started kind of meeting some of those people <coughs> like that way. But it is funny because yeah, so what happened is that um, 
I don't know. I, I would say like around 2001, 2002. Maybe more 2002 when it was started to like kind of be started intentionally bringing more like jam band acts in there. Right. And it was like really hit or miss, man. Because people, these like people were going in there expecting blues acts. And then there's some like electronic sort of like you know sound tribe type right. band um but not that great and people are like pissed leaving the club right so there was like some serious growing pains i would say with that um but he started bringing people like some of the galactic guys in right um i had met some friends I had met a f couple musicians that became really good friends, uh, Brandon Etzler and Steve Burke. We formed this band, OGD, and he was Alex was sort of talking to us about like who should he get of some of these old school guys to like bring in and do a show because this was like people were hip enough back then to know about Melvin Sparks. Oh yeah, because he toured with the Grey Boys and, and Carl put him yeah, on. Yeah, and, and like, he, but that's how yeah, I found out. Yeah, yeah, and but, I saw him on stage with the Grey Boys. I'm like, "Who is this?" And then next thing you know, I got the Texas Twister and I was right, like, "Right, okay. and all the like sort of, you know, like blue like blue some of those Grey blue breakbeat CDs right, turned me on to a lot of that stuff." Same. But I um, didn't know any of that. Perfect example is I saw the Grey Boys it was like Okay, Fred Wesley, JB's got that, but Melvin Sparks, what's that? Yeah. And then it was like Blue Note, Breakbeats, whatever, then the floodgates opened. Right. But it was like that future past. like you were Exactly. Mm -hmm. So so he wanted to do a show. With old school cats. Yeah, and we were like, yo, here's who you get. Like we told him, like, get Idris Muhammad, get Lonnie Smith, get Melvin Sparks, and then he got uh, Robert Mercurio on bass and um, uh, Fred Wesley. And so he did a big show like outside of the Boomer Room somewhere. I remember going. And then he did uh, uh, like an unannounced second night that we knew about. But uh, I, don't, I don't think it was like announced until like the day of or something. And it was just... Those guys, it was no Robert Mercurio. Um, it was just Lonnie, Melvin Sparks, Idris, wow. and Fred Wesley in that like in that small club. Oh man, it was it was fucking it was a dream. Come yeah, true. it was like I could have died and gone to heaven that day. Like it was so. So now, like I, the way I got to know Lonnie was that he was. At Yoshi's, so Yoshi's was also amazing back then. Right. Uh, one act would be there for a week, like yeah, <laughs> five to six nights. Two shows a night. Yeah, if it was a bigger, like a, if it was like a Schofield or a like McCoy Tyner would do two weeks. Right. Or but anybody, you know, if it was like even like or Jimmy Smith did uh, five or six nights. I remember seeing. Was him. it only old school cats, or they book in like? A no, they book. Younger guys too, but it too. wouldn't be like necessarily that long unless it was someone like Josh Redman or right. someone like bigger names. Sure. But uh, so Lonnie was there for I want to say five nights, and it was him and Jimmy McGriff, two organs, and with drum. Jimmy McGriff's band. Okay. Uh, Jimmy was in rough shape because he had MS, and I think that was one of the re reasons Lonnie was there. Also, was to kind of help carry him a little. Yeah, carry everything. Man, like, and that was another just, like, like that feeling that I told you about when I was 14 and I felt that feeling of what it felt like to play the blues or, like, feel the blues. This was, like, that times a freaking million. Like, those dudes were so soulful. It was crazy. So I went every night. And this, I had befriended somehow this this organ player. He was a gospel organ player and preacher in Oakland. And we used to run together all the time and like, kind of show each other. Like I didn't know any gospel stuff. He would show me some chords. I would show him some jazz stuff. And uh, so he was a little more outgoing. I I'm sort of like half super shy and will lay back, half sociable depending on my mood. And so my friend, 
and I were talking to Lonnie, and so my friend is like, finds out where he's staying, and uh, we go to his hotel, and call, and they he tells the receptionist that he's his nephew or something, <laughs> and so Lonnie's like. You guys can't come up, but come back tomorrow, knock on the back door, I'll, I'll hang with y'all. So, that's what we did, man. I just kept going back. Lonnie would let us backstage, let us hang out with them. And um, it was like the second to last night. And, you know, I'm like a broke student living, you know, hand to mouth. He's like, all right, man, I'll see you tomorrow. And I'm like, man, I, I can't come tomorrow I don't have any more money and he's like oh man just come knock, knock on the back door I'll let you in so Dr. Lonnie Smith <laughs> lets this 20 year old kid like in the back door and so at that gig I met this guy his name's Pete Falico and I knew who he was because he had produced some records. Like, he produced this live record where Jimmy Smith and Joey DeFrancesco played together. It was an SF Jazz show back in the day at Bimbo's. And I had seen his name on some other, like, there were some, like, like organ compilation albums, but they weren't, it wasn't like a compilation of songs. Like, they actually recorded the songs for this record. Like, they had, like, Joey and Medeski and all these different organ players of you know, playing on this one record. So I met him, and he was a good friend of Lonnie. So I became friends with Pete, and then I used to go run with Pete to see Lonnie, and that kind of got me in with Lonnie. So then from there, I just sort of would pursue, you know, knowledge from Lonnie. Um, and that's how I got to know him. Like, that's... That's basically, you know, he's just super generous. And it's coming back to this thing of these old school cats. Just, if they don't share their knowledge with you, it dies. It dies. Right. Like but, said, and that, but that's tradition. not the way it works for them. Right. Like, for them, they had cats do the same thing for them. Right. They had guys that, like, taught them when they were too young and had no business playing with them. You know, it's the same thing. It's just a cycle, and they understand that. So I think that's one of the reasons Lonnie was uh, really nice to me. Right. Uh, and, like, let me in his world. So it also, it was concurrent with Alex starting to bring some of those guys in. So that's, I, so I met Melvin Sparks when, at that Boomer Room show. And Melvin says to me, yeah, man, we'll play the game. We'll, we'll play together one day. And I was like, what? <laughs> uh, okay. So Alex <laughs> started bringing his band out. Like, you know, maybe every three or four months or something like that. Yeah. And, and we formed that band OGD. Me, Brandon, and Steve formed OGD specifically so we could open for Melvin. So then we, I got to know Melvin... And it's same sort of thing. Like, he'd come through town and give me, you know, advice and mentored me. And eventually I got to play with him. I, 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 he came into town with his band. And I was like, hey, man, will you, can you stay an extra night and I'll pay you to play a gig with me? And he did it. It was like I couldn't believe it. Right. So, um, I don't even really remember who was on the gig. I just remember I got to play with him. And he stayed an extra night to play with me. And uh, he brought, he was the one that brought me down to New Orleans for my first Jazz Fest. What year, roughly? 2003. Three. Exactly. Okay. I was there. <laughs> yeah. But that's really cool that he brought you to Fest to Dude. play a gig with him. Yeah, so my friend George. What room? What's that? What room was that gig? Oh, it was at Cafe Brazil. Yeah, they were in Frenchman. Back when Frenchman was still funky. Yeah, when we get yeah, super funky. And yeah. then... Uh, the, On the corner uh, there. That's not even open anymore. No, nope. Well, it Brazil. hasn't been open for like... Yeah, three, four more, years. More than that. I feel like it's been a really long There's time. There's nothing there. They just yeah. like brass band set up in the corner. Right. Right. And then we played Old Point Bar in Algiers. Oh, uh, yeah, dude. I saw a bunch of killing gigs there. Yeah, there was nobody there. Really? It was like 4 a.m. We were like falling asleep. Outside of the club, like, waiting to play. I remember Neil Evans played with somebody right before us. 
Um, but he hired George Slupik. Yeah, from uh, Robert Walters' band. Yeah, Dr- he, drummer from exactly. San Diego. He's great. George, yeah, he plays on the first couple of Robert. Yeah, he's, George is the man. Yeah. So he moved from San Diego to New York to play with Melvin, and it was because of him. He's like, "Yo, man, get Will on these gigs." Oh, right on. And so it was because of him that he got me on those gigs in New Orleans. So George and I were rolling around New Orleans together. And while we were waiting for that Old Point gig to start, we were just walking around Algiers and Melvin's telling us stories about Lou Donaldson back in the day. Oh, man. You know? Yeah. And um, so Melvin became like another mentor. And he actually, uh, he wanted me to move to New York to play in his band. But I had just moved in with my lady like three weeks earlier. I had just taken this teaching gig at the jazz school in Berkeley. It was like things were kind of like solid here. And it just didn't feel like the right move. Right. Um, And I don't know that I could have survived in New York just on his band. But it's one of those things where you got to commit to it if you're doing it. Yeah, it's cut through it. So, yeah, and I... um, that's I don't whole, regret whole not doing it, but it was I was bummed that I didn't I, I, that I couldn't like right. play with him regularly. Um, of course, because you know it was one of those things that I was like super honored that he asked me to do it. But um, yeah, uh, that was sort of like the first my first like getting into playing with those level cats, right. and then um, yeah, man, Jerice is on my first record. Oh wow! Yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> So that was like okay. I play. I get to. I get with Lonnie. I get with Melvin, and Idris was sort of like my next. Like yeah. man, I gotta hook up with Idris, and I, I was kind of scared of him, because I remember at the Boomer Room, like he just seemed really gruff, and kind of like, like I didn't want to mess with him. Like oh yeah, he's a G. He just had that like super, like don't mess with me vibe. Sure. Which, he so, oh yeah, so, uh, but less approachable than say a Lani or a Melvin. Yeah, or a Melvin. Okay. Yeah, or it seemed that way to me. Right. Because during that time, my friend Brandon, who was who was a drummer, talked to Idris, and Idris was super cool, and he helped him like set up his kit and all that stuff. But uh, eventually, I think it was kind of like I was bugging Alex, like, "Yo, dude, let's get Idris out of here. Like, I, I want to play with Idris." Yeah. And um. Uh, I should also mention around that time, Will Bernard hired me to play in his band okay. in 2003. And Will had all those New Orleans ties. Sure. Like, was playing with Stanton, Stanton and Robert right. and, like, That's getting into that. That's how I Will. Yeah, and yeah. He, he had played with Idris. So then Idris came through town. So I, I, yeah, I was just, like, bugging Alex about it. Then Idris was in Ahmad Jamal's band. They come through Yoshi's. I go... And I, at this point, I knew Alex had talked to Idris about coming out. And first off, that was maybe top five shows ever I've seen in my life. Like, they were on fire and just completely incredible. Um, and afterwards, Idris was talking to people. And I was like, hey, man, I'm Will. Uh... Alex at Boom Room, Room was um, was talking about trying to hook us up, and he's like, "Oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, man, <laughs> man, I like you. You're not, you're cool, man." Like he just liked me. He liked my vibe. Yeah. He thought I was nice, and that's why he played with me. He hadn't even heard me play, he and just he the just liked the, the the way I came at him. Right, and. I don't know. I guess I just happened to come at him at the right way. He was super cool. Alex set it up. And, um... Uh... Yeah. We played a couple nights. I think we played one night at Boomer Room and then I set up... There used to be this club that we all play at in Petaluma called uh, Zebulon's. Zebulon's Lounge. Or Zebulon Lounge. Anyways, I, I booked us a gig up there. It was me, Dries, Will... And my friend Dana Stevens, um, who's who's from here and is a New York guy now. And through that gig, Idris was down 
And I was able to eventually, and I bugged him a lot. I was able to get him on my first record, which Pete Falico, who got me deeper in with Lonnie, produced that, produced and released on it. He had, he at that time he had started a organ label, like an imprint. Called, yeah, called Doodling Records. I so I, I man, I, I mean, I kind of worked, <laughs> I kind of worked on Idris for a while. Right. Like we had played together a few times, and I, I was always good about like I would call these guys and just have conversations with them and talk to them and I would just you know you know I call Lonnie and just shoot the shit with him or I call Melvin and shoot the shit with him or call Idris and just talk to these guys and like they were always cool and would always talk and like as a matter of fact like if I was going to call Idris I would always have to leave like an hour like I'd, I'd have to know like I'd have to know I had nothing to do for an hour because right. he was he was down to talk and the funny thing is, that's man, game. That's like, you, dude, that you, I, I can't, <laughs> you I'll know? tell you, man, like, I don't think, I think like playing with Idris was almost the most excited I've ever been before a gig. Like, I, I can't express how much, like, like I'll, the, the organ drummer relationship is really important. It's like the bass drummer relationship. Cause you are playing bass. Right. Like, the, like the relationship between the two, it's like super important. I know. And Idris is that guy with all the organ players. Right. So um, when when I got to play with him, it was just such a big deal that I got to play with him, and I was just thrilled. Um. So yeah, I would just call him and talk to him, and he, you know, we just talk about back in the day or whatever politics, yeah. like. I remember talking to him about Obama getting elected, like everything, you know, yeah. it's just like touring back in the day, like just hearing from just everything. Cat. Yeah. Just like, yeah. I just, not just any old cat, like the, cat. yeah, the guy <laughs> and just like, re, like him telling me all the stuff that he played on that you didn't realize he played on. Right. Like that's him on Superfly. It's crazy. And you listen to it and like, I know it's playing really well. It's like, Oh yeah. Like, right. that's, that's it's dreams. funny it's because like when it. I, when I was saying, uh, with Melvin and then plundering the Blue Note vaults and stuff back in the pre-internet era when I was like, you know, first hearing Rare Groove music. Inevitably, every song that I was like, damn, this is grooving, was Idris. Yep. Like, yeah. Inglewood Cliffs, New Jersey, Rudy Van Gelder, Idris on the drums. Yeah. You know, New Orleans cat, but playing that new, hard New York. Yeah. Proto-hip-hop shit, right? Well, and that's the thing that, like, for guys like you and I, like, or, or just anybody of our generation is like, we heard Idris. We right. didn't know we heard him. Precisely. But we heard him. Like right. Tribe, we, De La Soul, like any of those, oh. you know, we heard him a yeah. lot. Yeah. And so there's, there's it, it like, Ty, it's interesting that, like, I got into that music without realizing that it was part of my, like, music in high school. Right. Like, I, I had no idea. But that's, I think, the beauty of the whole full circle nature right. of it. And naturally, I feel like, we got it, you know, I've been meaning to get to this, but I just wanted to get to it organically. But you sure. talk about the organ and drums relationship. And for me personally, like before I was really <coughs> super familiar with Adam Deitch as a drummer um, or even remotely familiar outside of the first Lettuce record and the Schofield stuff. Right. Idris was like the funkiest, illest drummer that I could. When people, Who's your drummer? It's like Idris yeah. is the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and like now, so I, the reason I'm sitting across from you right now and I'm so familiar with your career is because of your work with Adam. And
he's sort of become the yeah he's your cat the yeah, cat for sure like even before I knew you I kind of knew that you know well, what I mean like I waved the flag pretty hard you know? <laughs> but you know, it's funny because you know I was there for the night at the boom when it first went down for y'all right you know so now when I hear about, about how you were schooled by cats and like your ethos and how you came up and there's so much more I wanted to explore there but I mean you just broke it down for me like how you saddled up to these giants in a super organic way and then for a guy like Adam I mean that's the type of people he wants to connect with musically yeah that totally. were bred like that so for it to happen in such an organic way and he I've been following his career for since the Schofield era okay. you know that's when I was yeah, introduced yeah. to him um, introduced to his music I should say and, right. and I've really been like hardcore kind of picking up on everything he's putting down and the way he and you have connected um, and the project the Adam Deitch Quartet and so forth um, I feel like it's brought out a different side of his playing almost like that Idris sure. Steve, that yeah, stuff yeah, yeah, that yeah. he really doesn't get to employ quite with Lettuce right. the space and the dynamics and right. then obviously not with the break science stuff yeah. and with the Sco stuff he's more yeah, it's like a different, it's different. totally different but it is that mold that we're talking about that Oregon drums relationship like you whatever you and him have enables him to go there and I mean you know well first it was a Lettuce a after show kind of thing at the boom and you guys sort of organically came well, together. I was thinking about this today because I, f I thought I was going to be talking to you. And, um, yeah, I remember that, uh, and I'll, we should speak about more about the organ drummer thing because that's important too. But uh, I remember, like, it was really last minute. It was like, him and I had, like, sat in together you know for maybe a song or something like that here or there but like we had never like played together right and i think um we we definitely met for the first time at jazz fest i know that um and i think the first time i saw him play was in new orleans so i we had been going back and forth about playing right. like and they had this gig I, I i guess it must have been a lettuce gig yeah right yeah uh and I called Alex and I was like, yo, man, me and Deitch want to do something tonight. I think it was like that. Like, tonight, we want to do this. Like, just don't worry about money. Just give us the door. Like, or part of the door or whatever. Yeah, we'll play duo. People will will get guests to come sit in. It'll be great. And so, I think it was actually, so I think it was officially, like, just him and me. And then I so James Casey was there because he was in lettuce at the time. James Casey was in lettuce. Yeah, he did about eighteen months. I didn't know of that. lettuce. Okay, yeah. that makes Before sense. Before Trey, because I was yeah, wondering, James Casey. it was a dual sax with Zoid. I could, I didn't know why he was like thinking back on it. I didn't yeah. know why he was there, but so he came up. I don't think we had met before. Kofi, right? Yeah. So at the very, I knew Ooh. Kofi. I already knew Kofi. But I mean, Kofi. But was yeah, Kofi. Yeah, yeah, Kofi was present. Reasons, I still don't know. It was well, well they time? must have been because Kofi was there. Wait, was James? James wasn't in, in that band, was no. he? No. Okay. No, he was touring with Lettuce, okay. like official. But you know. You know well, much right. better but no, than I, I, I have a firm recollection that Kofi was present Kofi was that there. Night, and he came on and played the boom. Uh, well, I'm trying little. to remember. Was like Maurice there? Mm, maybe. Maurice like might have been there, too, night. because, you know, that would make sense if Maurice and Kofi right. were there, because Maurice be was Chucks. in the band yeah. back then, too. I'm going to look that up after we're off the air, and okay. put, I'll put it all together for Cool. Uh, so, so that's just one of those organic nights and, with Captain yeah. in town. And I met, Bl I didn't even, I had never heard of Bloom right. until that night. Yeah. Like, I didn't know about Eric Bloom, and... He got up and sat in, and I was like, damn, this dude's Well, he's a jazz rad. cat and a half. Well, yeah, and him and I connect a lot on being, being... There's, It's really rare, actually, to have musicians that can play jazz and funk. Right. Like, usually you get people who can play one or the other. It's super rare that you get people that play both. So, him and I feel like get along really well yeah. because of that. Like, we can both do both. He talked like we about both. that before, about oh, okay. you. Oh, yeah? Outside of your Madrone gig when he invited his uh, jazz cat, Benny Benet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Outside of that gig, he basically was explaining how cats like you and him 
straddle that line, but most cats are either a jazz cat or a funk or a cat. Or funk guy, yeah. But both is a, is a rarefied air. It is pretty rare. Yeah. Like, you don't find a ton of people That's like that. It's funny you say that, because he literally said that verbatim that Oh, night. yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's 100% true. Um, so, yeah, I think we just played, like, you know, like, Root Down and People Make the World Go Around right. and stuff like that. You know, just stuff. We just sort of common tunes yeah. that we all knew. And then, yeah, at the very end, Deitch was like, yo, we were kind of done, and but the audience still wanted some more. And right. um, Kraz was there, too. Was he, was he still, still in Lettuce, Lettuce at that point? Yeah. Because I didn't remember that. I yeah. didn't remember Kraz being there until the record. I heard the recording. Um, well, yeah, that's, it could be. We'd have to look at, at the dates. Because no, he was there. also toured with Tedeschi Trucks. Oh. So he could have been there with them or with Let. Okay. I would say 2014, he was still active, let us I touring. think so. Yeah. So, this is 2014. So Deitch is like, December. Will, Kofi, get up there and play a ballad. December 2013, excuse me, that's when this is. Okay. Yeah, December 2013. Definitely Kraz still in Okay. Lettuce. So Deitch tells us, like, just go up there and play a ballad. A ballad. So, yeah, I think. I mean, I don't know why we played a ballad, so we played Georgia on my mind. And Kofi. Me, that's Kofi on flute, me on organ, just the two of us. Jeez. And it's pretty rare, like that the boom room gets quiet, and I, there might not have been even a ton of people there at that point in the night. But you know, uh, it was something that I felt special in the moment, just the feeling of of playing the song with Kofi. And then, then uh, I was on tour in February, and I just had my phone on shuffle, and that I have that the bootleg of that oh, show. Right. And it comes on, me and Kofi playing Georgia. And then I find out he passed away. Like, oh my God, maybe that weird. day or the day after or something like that. But, uh, yeah, I had, yeah. I actually heard him play with you guys when you finally put together the Adam Deitch Quartet. Mm-hmm. And your first year you played at the Boom, or excuse me, at the Blue the Nile Blue Jazz Fest. Kofi came out and played a song on flute with y'all. There, oh, wow. The first year. I don't There's a video. That. Randy has it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was the first year um, that I, I might have even been the first time I, I saw the Adam Dutch Quartet. First year, I remember. Well, actually, the first year was not at the Blue Nile. I was at the Little Gym and no one came. <laughs> I don't think I was at that one. Yeah, so we played the Little Gym upstairs. It was before it was like called the Adam Deitch Quartet. It was just us. Right. Uh, you know, we the four of us just liked the vibes. Must have been before I got to I New think Orleans, there was like I have 15 or 20 people there. There was like nobody mm-hmm. there. First weekend. Probably. Yeah, but then the next year, I do remember that year, like a crap load of people sat in. Yeah. Like it's not some, it's more like concise now. Like we have our original tunes and maybe a couple people sat right. in. But that first year, like I remember Splat sat in and a, yeah, a bunch of people sat in. Well, I wanted to build the buzz and make people know about it. Yeah. That's kind of, but. I really like the streamlined thing like that you guys have right now. But before we get into the recording of the album and, um, and maybe the future a little bit of that project, um, the organ drummer relationship you wanted to... Oh, yeah. I just like... So first off, and this isn't me. I didn't grow up in church, but like a lot of church cats, gospel church cats, play drums and organ. And I play drums and organ. So drums is my original instrument. And part of the reason I was able to, like, when I was just starting out on organ, like, Will Bernard will tell you this, like, I was rough when I first started playing with him. Like, I was not there. (laughs) Right. But I had rhythm. Like, I had this rhythmic thing. You can't teach that, really. You get Yeah, and I think I grew up playing drums, so I had a rhythm thing. And rhythm is, you know, like, you can get by with good rhythm and some fun, funny notes. Right. Like, you'll learn, hopefully, to play the right notes. But I think the reason I, like, connected with so many drummers is, A, because I want to. Like, those are the guys, those are the the musicians I get the most pumped to play with are the drummers. Um, but I also have, like, a really good relationship with drummers just because I grew up playing drums. So when I'm playing with them... Not only am I checking out what they're doing because I'm trying, I want to let steal their shit, (laughs) but I'm also uh, like a little maybe deeper in there 
than someone who's not a drummer. Like, just as far as my level of attention and focus. Right. Um, so, a lot of drummers always say they like playing with me, and I think that's because I grew up playing drums, and that I just genu- genuinely, like, love playing with drummers. And I think um, just having that, you know, like hand in glove thing with the yeah. drummer is really important. Like Lonnie talks about that with Idris. Um, you know, Jimmy Smith had that with Donald Bailey, who was another uh, great organ drummer who lived in Oakland, who I got to play with one one time. Wow. Um, you know, Jimmy had that with, with him. Uh, Leon Spencer and Idris had that. Uh, uh, Don Patterson and Billy James. Like, you know, the, the list goes on and on. Like, or like you think about like Sly and Robbie, drums and bass. Sure. You think about um, um, uh, Bootsy and Clyde. Yeah. Or Java. Paul Jackson. And yeah, Paul Jackson and Mike Clark. Clark. Or Mike. Or or yeah. Or uh, <laughs> I think it's a little deeper with Mike because those guys have a little more history. Right. Like they grew up in Oakland together. But um, like the bass drums thing is just yeah. is, is really the foundation of anything. Yeah. You know of any musical situation this well especially in you know a setting with those instruments obviously i just really i mean you know i pay a lot of obviously attention to the different deitch projects mm-hmm. but the first thing that adam and i ever connected with like person to person was hip-hop yeah was sure like, that makes sense he recognized you know, I had written some stuff about lettuce and kind of name checked uh, some hip hop that they nodded to. They wasn't on the nose. You kind of had to pay attention. And right. I think he was like, "Oh shit, this dude is paying ears. attention." <laughs> right. And uh, and you know, break science is a much more electronic thing. And while lettuce definitely gets into some like real dillified hip hop, it's yeah. this whole band ensemble. Yeah. Your partnership with him and the organ drums relationship has unlocked this fucking ill shit that he's been carrying around for decades that right. he's never really had the outlet for. Sure. Yeah. And you, in addition to Benny and Zoid, of course, mm-hmm. all at once. And, and yeah, people I mean, are that's, really excited about it. That's, I'm, I'm glad. I mean, I'm excited about it. The thing about that band is that the thing about... I mean, this goes for anything in life, I think, whether it's whatever, like your work a basketball team or a sports team, bands, whatever. Like, you can get a bunch of people who are good at what they do, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have chemistry or, right. like, something good is going to happen. Um, with that band, every time we played, it was getting better. Just and It just felt good. Um and we, I mean, you know, like for a while, I mean, we don't play very often. Like it's like. A couple times a year. If that sometimes. Right. Like there was a while where it was just like the once a year at Jazz Fest for a few years or right. something like that. And the every time. comes alive or whatever. Yeah, every time it would get better. Yeah. And like that's really rare where it's just like four people just have chemistry together and complement each other. Um, and Besides I, that though, do you exchange uh email hey have a listen to this and work out a part and you email it back or is it just when you're together no uh here's the incredible thing about deitch is that um he wrote all the music yeah except one song you wrote but when i say he wrote all the music he didn't just write like some chords and say do whatever he wrote your part he wrote my part and i'm not saying that in a bad way but like he actually wrote like stuff I would play, like the right voicings chords, the right stuff. voicings, exactly like the right chord voicings, the right, like it just like when another instrument writes for your instrument, sometimes it can be kind of rough because they don't understand how something lays on an instrument feel wise. Mm-hmm. Um, but with Deitch, it's just like I've never felt like I had to adjust anything he's written. But also the horns and the harmonies, that's all him. Like, he he basically sent us, like, demos that are, like, you know, uh, like, produced type beat sounding stuff with, like, right. MIDI sounds and stuff like that. Um, and then we just learned them. So it's it hasn't been necessary. Like, 
the one thing that we have done is suggested different tunes for the sets. You right. Know, like, hey, can we do this tune? Or, hey, can we do that tune? Like, you know, I think I suggested uh, The Way You Make Me Feel. Right. Um, I love that arrangement. You guys yeah. know that. And I, you know where that came from? Like, the first time I heard that the was... The MJ versus Stevie thing that you guys did? The first time I heard someone do that was Jimmy McGriff and Dr. Lonnie at that Yoshi oh. show. And Similar so, arrangement of it? Yeah, so yeah. Like people, Oregon. people like, that's kind of an organ thing. There's certain, right. like, tunes and that. Uh, I heard them do it, and then I started doing that. And then I actually started doing it with Stanton before I did it with Deitch. Um, but yeah, you know, Benny's a huge MJ fan. Of course. And yeah. so, well, I mean, so is Deitch, but Benny's like huge. So, uh, yeah, like a lot of the songs were already fully formed. And then we just build from there right. on what he wrote. I mean, I, I a composition like Egyptian Secrets is just like... It, it blows my mind, you know. And the fact that yeah. Adam wrote all the part, those horn lines, those sort of uh, harm, harmonizing horn parts and the organ parts and the bass lines, it's amazing. But what really makes it come to life is in the live element, man. Yeah. The way that, and and that's what I mean. It's like you and him. I, I stand behind you, you know, at the Nile. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking over your shoulder. I can see your feet and your hands. But then I'm looking into his eyes through the symbols right. and watching him respond to you. Yeah. And it's it's a side of him that I just don't see in any of the other combos, and it's amazing. Yeah, that's, you know? I mean... And vice versa with you. Like, I've seen you play in a lot of combos, but, like, what you do in that particular combo is really Yeah, special. I mean, it's cool because I feel like there's all these dimensions, like, sides of ourselves that we can use in that band that we don't and we can fully use all of them pretty much in that band where you might not be able to in other bands like right. you know like I, i'm not idiom, like the funk idiom the jazz idiom. yeah like the dilla stuff like I'll, right. i i'm trying to put some of that like feeling in the organ you know like i don't get to do that with everybody because not everyone's privy to that right. so um so there's just a lot of different sides of it that yeah. we get to, like I think Deitch is more he's not just one thing you know I'm not yeah. just one thing like I have a lot of like I mean you're on we haven't really, the reggae band yeah, yeah and I mean we haven't even really talked about all the stuff I listen like I listen to a lot of music like right. I'm not definitely have things that I like and that hit home for me but I like you know like and Deitch what would we Deitch be surprised to hear that, uh, that, that you get off on I was I mean I'm obsessed with like Bonavir and Frank Ocean. Frank Ocean's amazing. I'm he, not to say Bonavir uh, is not. I'm just no, not no, no, for sure. It. And I mean, maybe that's like more obvious stuff. But then like Aphex Twin. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I was going to raves in Chicago, like back when I was a teenager. What were some of the electronic artists back then, or DJs? Uh, that I, were back into? then, it was like Plastic Man, Aphex Twin. Yeah. Um, there was, a, you know, there's DJs like Frankie Knuckles sure, and like late, all that. I was into a lot of that stuff. Um, it was like just a Chicago house. Drum and bass, yeah. Um, I don't listen to a ton of that stuff now, but I, it's like I, I listen love to... Too. So does Dutch for that matter. Yeah, yeah. Oh, of course. So I just feel like there's a lot of stuff in the musical fabric that can get expressed. And then like, you know, Benny's a jazz guy too, right. so him and I can take things there. Like I can... The other thing is there's a little more without a guitar player and without a bass player, there's a little more freedom for me to shift harmonies and add stuff and be a little more loose with the arrangements. Right. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, it's just... There's, there's a lot of room for us to express different elements of ourselves in that band, I feel. I would agree, man, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I don't want to spill the beans too much. I know that you guys recorded a record some time ago. There's some wheels moving yeah, in that direction. So It's been a while, too. Yeah. I mean, I think the first session was like three and a half years ago, yeah. and the second session was like almost two years ago now. Plenty of footage available from the different Jazz Fest shows on YouTube and such, and some really awesome performances like Ashlyn Parker comes out and plays trumpet on one of them we watched the other day. I think that was maybe not this past year, but the year before. Right. Um, oh, yeah. 
there's just yeah there's like a lot it's of it's hard different... to even remember all the people right. that have come out and played, yeah. but we touched on for a second uh, you know you take gigs and go out on the road with like a groundation reggae right. band just took you overseas right yeah and after all this time at the different eras of the boom boom room and all these different amazing cats that we've talked about you've played with from Dr. Lonnie to Melvin Sparks to Idris, later Stan Moore, I know you played with Billy Martin, Will yeah. Bernard, so forth. I have All my the duo way, Amandola versus Amandola Blades, Blades, which is, duo. is... Yeah, I've seen you play that. Yeah, um, which is something we'll be focusing on a lot, like, in the coming up. we got a new record coming out that's good in to October. Know. Are you yeah. Royal Potato? Royal Potato's putting it out in October, and we got uh, Jeff Parker from Tortoise, nice. Skerrix on it, and Ciro Baptista. I love, percussion. love all three. So they're guests. They're like it's still a duo, and then we got guests on right. certain tunes. I think Ciro actually might play on the whole record, though. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely furnish me with a song, and we'll play it on the show when For the sure. time that's going to come out. But I wanted to just hear, uh, you know, you come back from overseas. We got a bunch of boxes being packed up. Your home of thirteen years. You're taking your wife and kids, and you're moving right. to Los Angeles after yes. two decades in the Bay. Yeah. Um, I don't want to dwell on why you have to leave. I think we've kind of understood that things have changed and right. you're ready for a new chapter. What are you looking to do musically and otherwise in SoCal, being that you're really like a, a prodigal son of the Bay Area? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, so I'll start with saying that this is bigger than just me. So it's sort of a family thing. Like my wife is a video editor. Okay. Um, and it's sort of a move for both of us because she she really wants to get down to LA and pursue you know more TV and film work, less tech work, right? Um, which is unfortunately you know all there is up here for yeah. the most part. For me, as much as I've loved being here, like and it's been like really formative for me. I just feel like I need to change the scenery. Sure. Um, I always thought that change of scenery would be New York. Um, it's not quite possible now. Right. Um, and our daughter's going into high school, so like right now is the time. Yeah. And it just feels like uh, with all the changes in the city and uh, there just not being a ton of places to play, um, that I'm kind of just opening myself to the possibilities of Southern California more than I had a specific plan. Okay. Um, I will say that I'm super intrigued by what's happening down there with like Kendrick Lamar and sure. well, the Black Kamasi and Brain Feeder and... TDE, all that, right. There's just... It's vibrant. Yeah, and... Um, and that's not I just, really you know, Kraz just moved there. Yeah. We're, we're scheming. Oh, that's um, music to my ears. Yeah, we've been... LA looks good on him. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, more he's, ways than one. he's been talking about going to, to California for like 10 years. years. We, he's right. been talking to me about it for a long time. Um, so that will be... Like, we're talking about hopefully trying to do some regular stuff. I you know, so. me and Carl D have always played together. Right. Here I've, I think that might have been the first time I ever, ever heard you play was a sit-in with the Tiny Universe oh, okay. way back when. Yeah, I did a tour with them yeah. one time, and I'm on one of his records also. The tri He did a trio record. Yeah, KD3. Yeah, yeah. I'm on that. And um, and he's down in San Diego. So yeah, I so I mean, there's. I feel like some of my regular collaborators are down there already. Sure. And, um Sputs out of there down to Sputs there sometimes. Okay. He's still a Texas cat, but he's gotcha. down there. We've, we've talked about that. Um, I have a list of dream musicians down there, which right. I'm going to keep to myself for now. Right. I'm putting into the universe. Uh, but I'm kind of just like, I, I, being from the Midwest, like I've always felt slightly alien in California. Yeah. Even though like I love living in the Bay Area. I never thought I'd live in L.A., Ever. Right. <laughs> but uh, I'm just opening myself to the possibilities of the opportunities down there. And I don't know quite what that is yet. So I'm going to get down there. I'm going to set up some instruments, call some people. Right. And see what I can get going. Um, but I will say the one unfortunate thing about the Bay is that Sometimes to take the next step, you have to go to New York or L.A. or some somewhere like that. And and most people have done that. Like if you think about a Charlie Hunter or a Joshua Redman or right. a 
Will Bernard or various people that have 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 left the Bay who are like Bay people. It just um, the opportunities here are unfortunately there's not enough industry here. Right. Um, and there's even less industry here now, right. whatever that means. I mean, I think with technology now, there's sort of industry everywhere. Yeah, but because I we, get what you mean. But there's not the sort of opportunities that there are in New York and L.A. where you're just around people who are doing certain thing, uh, things at a certain level. Right. Um, so I'm just, I don't know. I'm just kind of going down there with an open mind and and hoping to just do some new stuff. I don't I honestly don't know what that is yet. Well, so that cool. kind of remains to be seen and it's part of what's really exciting and extremely scary. That's about life. Knowing that. Yeah. Um, and I look forward to coming back here as a visitor to yeah. be honest. Like I, think I love the Bay Area. Well, and I think you know when you play every week almost when right. you're in town or all, like it, of course like at least every comes month out, I will be drunk. it becomes yeah. oh I guess you will you know right. uh, next month or whatever you know it just spreads everything thin whereas as I think I'll be a little more focused when I come into town now well let us know uh, in advance of course and we'll beat the drum and get out you know it was nice to go out the other night and sort of your quote last real gig at the boom yeah with some local cats and, I was uh, glad it was with local guys yeah yeah, I like I like that band. That was cool, man. It was super yeah. fun, man. I had a blast. Yeah, Victor's a beast. Man. Yeah, you know, this is a good combo of people. Yeah. So, well, dude, we went much longer than we thought. Yep. It was all good stuff, man. Yeah, and we man. left a lot on the table. Yeah. So for when, sure. maybe next time, you know, in a year from now, we can check in and see, you know, how life in LA is and what's <laughs> happened between then and now. But in the meantime, we'll look for that Amendola Blades. Duo album coming on uh, Royal Potato this yep. fall, October. Yeah, October. we actually have a West Coast tour booked already. Sweet. Like L.A. four nights at SF Jazz. Let us know. I'll read the Seattle. dates on the air. But uh, cool man. Well, signing off. This is uh, Will Blades. Is on his way from the Bay to L.A. So hopefully SoCal will be waiting for him with open arms. Thanks, Will, for uh, taking the time out of your uh, your move yeah, and uh, your busy schedule. Yeah, I'm b- Honored to do it, man. Thanks. Yeah, man. Well, we wish you well. And we'll sign off for the Up for Life podcast in South Berkeley, California. This is B. Getz, and we'll see you next time. Say thank you and a deep bow of gratitude to Will Blades inviting me into his home as they're packing up to move after so long here in the Bay, such an emotional and hectic time. It was just just awesome to sit down with my man and chop it up about all the things, all the heroes, all the apprenticeships, all the changing of the guards, the collaborations, the projects, the releases. So please. Keep your finger on the pulse of all things Will Blades. Amendola vs. Blades album, Everybody Wins, out on Royal Potato Family Records. Adam Deitch Quartet album, Egyptian Secrets, out on Golden Wolf Records. So check it out. And you heard Will talking about collabing with Eric Krasno down there in SoCal, and I'm happy to inform my listening audience that... Indeed, Eric Krasno will be the next guest, featured guest, on the ep- uh, episode 25 of the Up for Life podcast in about three weeks, Thanksgiving-ish. And I'm super stoked on that, obviously. Kras is, is an old friend and one of the giants in the game. So, yeah, looking forward to that. But before we say sayonara to episode 24, we got the Vibe Junkie Jam of the Week. Now, uh... First, in the background, you're hearing uh, DJ Gray Boy doing Texas Twister, which is an amazing, classic Melvin Sparks track. Melvin, we talked about at length in the interview with Will Blade, so I thought, why not 
throw down a little bit of freestyling from DJ Greyboy and the track Texas Twister, Melvin Sparks. Uh, but for the Vibe Junkie Jam of the Week, we're going to kind of reverse engineer it and go from this to the next chapter of throwback, hip-hop, rare groove, funk, sample-based, boom-bap, one foot in the past, one foot in the future. I'm real stoked about my man Dropical. He's a producer here in Northern California. He's the sound design and beat maker for Ultimate Fantastic, and also a tremendous multi-instrumentalist and producer in his own right. So we're going to lace up uh, track off his latest EP. The track is called 11th Hour. The EP is called Circling Out. It's available on Jumpsuit Records. Um, and it's pretty diverse and solid all the way through. A little bit of electronic, a, a lot of sample based boom bap, a little bit of like futuristic hip hop. Um, just really cool and uh, diverse, colorful, kaleidoscopic smattering of sounds from a man tropical. So the Vibe Junkie Jam of the Week. I was going to play something longer, but then I was like, oh man, this interview's hella long, and uh, I should probably give you something potent, compact, uh, and, and something that maybe you're not familiar with. So we'll let the Texas Twister, DJ Greyboy, ride out for a moment or two, and then I'm going to say peace and yes indeedy while you hear Dropical, 11th Hour. Here on the Up Full Life Podcast, I'm your host, B. Getz, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>